will be. Um, I have got some slides that I think will help with the study. I hope I'm able to share them on the screen uh, properly uh, so that you all can see that instead of just simply looking at me. I'm going to go ahead and get that up right now. Okay, is that working? Can everybody see the slides? Somebody stick a thumb up if you can see the slides. Great. All right, fantastic. All right, we're going to talk about in our class tonight, we're just simply going to talk about the uh, introduction to the book. Uh, the author of the book of Mark, um, really, we don't know for sure, because he never identifies himself by name. He just simply gets right into the message um, and never says who it is that's doing the speaking. But we do know from many of the early Christian writers, in fact, really all of the early Christian writers, identify the writer as being uh, the one that's called in the Bible, John, who was called Mark. Uh, we find that that term used in the book of Acts in chapter 12. And in verse 12, it said, when he realized this, it's talking about Peter. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. John is assumed to be his Hebrew name. It was a very common name among the Jews, while Mark was a Roman name. And so it is assumed that he, like other Bible characters that we read about in the first century, uh, had both a Jewish and a Roman name. We find that uh, this man, John Mark, went with Barnabas and Saul the first time we read about him was in the uh, last part of the book of Acts when Barnabas and Saul were returning from Jerusalem back to Antioch after they had completed their benevolent service and they took with them John whose other name was Mark. This benevolent service we read about was in the last part of Acts chapter 11 where Agabus had foretold that there was going to be a famine in Jerusalem and so the disciples in Antioch determined that they were going to take up a collection and give to the needy saints there in Judea. And they sent that by Barnabas and Saul. And you'll notice that Barnabas is listed first in all of these references at this point. But Barnabas and Saul took this money uh, to Jerusalem. And then when they returned back to Antioch, they took uh, John with them. And the reason why is that we find out that Barnabas was actually a, a either a cousin or an uncle uh, to Mark. Uh, we read in the book of Colossians in chapter 4 there that he was a cousin of Barnabas, but as I understand it, the term literally means uh, son of sister, and so he would have actually been a nephew uh, to Barnabas. And so when uh, Barnabas and Saul were called by the Holy Spirit to set aside for the ministry that the Holy Spirit had for them, which we call today the first missionary journey. They actually took John Mark with them on this trip. And they traveled, first of all, to the island of Cyprus. Traveled throughout the island of Cyprus. There was opposition already from the Elimus, the magician who was opposing the, the message of Paul and was. Uh, uh, blaspheming against the scriptures, and that's where uh, Paul told him that he would be struck blind for a season. Uh, the proconsul of Cyprus was very impressed by this and, and became a believer. And from there, they traveled to Perga, which is in the region of Pamphylia, which is today the, the country of Turkey. Most of the scholars that I've read about this describe that as a very rough, uh, difficult area. And the only thing that we know is that when they got there, that uh, Mark decided no longer to travel with them. Uh, we find in verse 13, it says that when they came to Pergam and Pamphylia, John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, I want you to notice there that it says that he returned to Jerusalem. He did not return to Antioch, the place from where they began. Uh, one writer described this as saying he ran home to his mama. Um, and that's possibly true. Uh, we do know his mother lived in Jerusalem. That was the place where Peter went when he was released from the prison. And we're told that John did return back there to Jerusalem. Of course, we also know that Paul was not happy about that. Uh, when John Mark had returned, had left them there and had returned back, 
it says that when Barnabas had proposed to Paul that they would have a second journey to go back and visit the places they'd been before, it says that Paul thought it best not to take them, to take John Mark because he had withdrawn from them or had forsaken the work. And it said that there was such a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they could not work it out. They couldn't find a way that they could do this together. And so they actually ended up dividing the work up. Uh, they had been to the island of Cyprus. They had been onto the mainland of Asia Minor. And so Barnabas determined he would take John Mark to Cyprus while Paul decided to take Silas with him uh, to the mainland of, of Asia Minor. That's not the end of the story though between uh, Paul and John Mark. We find that later, about 10 years later, that Paul has trust and confidence in Mark. When he writes the letter to the Colossians, which he wrote from a Roman prison, uh, he says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So Mark now is with Paul when Paul is in prison there in Rome, and Mark is there with him. So whatever reason he had to have uh, quit this or whatever reason he might have uh, had for wanting to give up on that, we see that that has changed. Uh, so certainly Mark is a different kind of person uh, than what he had been before. We also read about him in the book of Philemon, which is really written at the same time as the book of Colossians. And again, Mark is described as a, uh, as a fellow worker there with Paul. And then finally in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last uh, letter that Paul wrote. Oh, and I got my slides. There we go. Uh, Paul writes there, Luke is alone with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to the ministry. Very strong, powerful language there, where before he said, I can't trust him. We don't want him to, I don't want him to go with us on this trip. Now he says he is very useful to me. One final note to talk about with the traditions associated with this gospel is the fact that many of the early Christian writers believe that Mark actually was uh, influenced by Peter when he wrote this gospel. And the reason they believe that is from what we read here in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. At the end of Peter's first epistle, he says, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Uh, the term son there, I don't think literally means that he was a biological son of Peter, but I think that it means that he was a spiritual son to Peter. In other words, Peter uh, was bringing him up, was training him, was guiding him, much like what Paul had done with Timothy. Timothy used that same, or Paul used that same language in describing Timothy, my son in the faith. And Peter seems to be using the same sort of language here for Mark. Uh, the reason why scholars believe that is that, of course, with Matthew, we know that Matthew was one of the apostles of Jesus. He was an eyewitness to the things that he wrote about. Luke, we're told, uh, was one who sought out the things that he presented in his gospel. John certainly was one of the disciples of Jesus and would have been giving his private reminiscences. But Mark is one that we don't really know what kind of connection uh, that he would have had uh, with Jesus. He was a, apparently a very young man. Uh, and so we really don't know what his connection would have been. And so scholars, I think to some extent have speculated uh, to say that uh, Mark got his gospel essentially from Peter. In fact, one writer even described it as really could be called the gospel of Peter. I, I think that's going too far. Um, there, there's really just nothing other than the speculation that, um, that Mark got his information uh, from Peter. All right, nobody has sent me a, a note that they've got a question, but if you got a question now, raise your hand or uh, we'll open up the, the microphones for anybody who has a question or comment before I get into the next point. Why did you say that 
the uh, that they say it might be the the gospel of Peter. I I missed that part. Could you repeat it? Yeah, happy to. Uh, First Peter chapter five verse thirteen, Peter describes uh, Mark as being his son. And because of the fact that Mark, we don't have any particular reference or reason why he would know anything about the life of Jesus. Scholars have kind of looked for where was his connection. And so they've sort of speculated that this must have been uh, Peter uh, is the one who gave that information to Mark. Anybody else with a, a comment or question? I, uh, I have a comment if that's all right. Yes, please. There, I was doing some reading to kind of prepare for today, and there's quite a few scholars that I've, I was reading through that believe that John actually wrote this to be for the Gentiles, because there are zero references to the, to the law. Um, there are few to no references to the prophets or the Old Testament, and John skips the lineage of Christ or the stories of John the Baptist, unlike uh, other uh, gospel writers. I thought that was very interesting. Yes, that's a very good point to make. Uh, the four Gospels, of course, each one of them stands alone. It's, um, I, I guess, what we could call unique or it has a place. That's that, that's going to be my next major point is what makes the Gospel of Mark unique. Uh, and I think some of that is very true. Uh, there is very little reference to the uh, Old Testament. Um, I think there's more than one reason for that, and I'll get into that uh, just a little bit, uh, a little bit later here in the lesson. But I think part of that would have been uh, Mark's gospel might have been designed for those who did not have that Old Testament background, uh, such as Matthew. Matthew has uh, far more quotations from the Old Testament than the other three gospel writers combined. Um, John, of course, was written. He says for those who. Uh, might have had doubts or don't believe that he that Jesus was truly the Son of God. The Gnosticism of the second and third century certainly would have been a, an issue there. And, and Luke seems to have been one that was written for the intellectuals, for the uh, the scholarly. Some people call it the gospel to the Greeks, whereas uh, Mark would have been the gospel to the Romans. Um, one final point I want to make before I move on to the to the next section. Most of the scholars assume that Mark's gospel was written first. And the reason they say that is because most of the information that is found in Mark's gospel is found also in either Matthew or Luke's gospel. In fact, one writer says there are only 24 verses in the gospel of Mark that are not found in one of the other gospels. And so they assume that it was written first and the other writers borrowed material from Mark as they wrote their Gospels. I find that to be a little bit more speculative than I'm comfortable. Uh, the fact is the Holy Spirit inspired all four of the Gospels, so they're going to have the same information because they come from the same source. Um, it, we do know, though, if we go over to the book of Luke in chapter 1, if you've got your Bibles with you, look uh, Luke chapter 1, in verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. What that tells us is at the time that Luke compiled his gospel, there were already of what he would call many other written accounts of the life of Jesus. Uh, so apparently there were many people who would write about the life of Jesus. It's not surprising in the first century that we would find that. And so it's very possible that Mark was one of the earliest ones who wrote this account of Jesus, and maybe Matthew and Luke and even John were familiar with it. But to say that they just borrowed his and added some own of their own uh, material of their own, I, I I find that a little too speculative. Let me move on to the, to the second major point that I want to look at this evening. And that's to ask the question, what makes the Gospel of Mark unique? How does it stand alone uh, from the other two synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and, and certainly from John's Gospels? There's a few points that I think are, are significant. Number one, Mark emphasizes the actions of Jesus more than the words of Jesus. Uh, 
And, and what I mean by that is that we're not going to find many of the sermons or the parables uh, that Jesus uh, deliver that are found in Matthew and, and Luke and in John. The key word, if there is one word that defines the gospel of Mark, is going to be this word immediately. Uh, most of the modern translations use the word immediately. The King James Version uses the word straightway. And that might actually be a better translation. Uh, in the questions I sent out for you, I asked, uh, to, what does this word immediately uh, mean to you? Uh, does anybody want to take a stab at, at answering that? Did anybody look it up to see what the original Greek word uh, meant? Straightway. This word um, is found, first of all, in chapter 1 and in verse 10. And just looking here, just in chapter 1, I want you to notice all the different references where we find that word. Verse 10, verse 12, I'm not going to read all of them, but notice how many times you keep seeing this idea of immediately. Verse 18, verses 20 and 21, and verse 28, over and over again, uh, the English standard that I have on there says at once, but it is the same Greek word in, in New American Standards It's translated immediately, his fame spread. Over and over again, you find this emphasis. It's used about 40 times in the Gospel of Mark, which is more than all of the other Gospels. In fact, I think more than every other place in the Bible combined. And so certainly this is a very key word. This word actually comes from a nautical term. It was used to describe someone who sailed a boat directly from one location to another. If you sailed in a straight line, that's the word that is used here, the verb that is used. And so when it's used in an adverb form, what it means is to do something getting right to it. Uh, we sometimes will use the phrase, let me get straight on that. And that comes from this same basic mm -hmm. idea in the Greek, that it is something that you're doing immediately are doing it quickly. Yeah. There's one other interesting place in this passage. Look, if you'll go, I don't have it on the screen, but in Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Actually, I think I may have it up here. Yes, I do have it up here. Uh, we find here where Mark records what is quoted from Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Making the path straight is the same verb that we find in the adverb form uh, translated as immediately. And so if you think about it, John the Baptist was preparing for Jesus to do things straight. John the Baptist got things ready and Jesus got straight to it. As I mentioned, in contrast to that, we find very few of the sermons of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain that are recorded in Matthew and Luke, they're not found in Mark's gospel. The, the chapter of parables that you find in Matthew or the many parables that you find in the gospel of Luke, for the most part, they're not found in Mark either. There's about a handful of parables that are found in Mark's gospel. The very long dialogues that Jesus had with his disciples that are found primarily in the gospel of John, you will not find those in Mark. Mark is all about action. Mark, I guess in some ways, is a, is a better historian in the fact that he gives us the activities of Jesus without giving us all the, uh, the words and the, uh, the teachings of Jesus. Now, the other question that I sent you out in the email today was to ask you to organize the the four Gospels chronologically by when they began uh, chronologically. Uh, the Gospel of John obviously is first. It starts with in the beginning. It starts with creation itself. The Gospel of Luke would have been second because it takes us back to the time of Abraham. I'm sorry, excuse me, Matthew is the one that takes us back to the time of Abraham. Luke would be third because Luke starts us off with the archangel Gabriel coming to Zacharias, the high priest, who was to be the father of John the Baptist. And 
Mark begins much later than all of those other Gospels. Yet, what's the very first words here in the Gospel of Mark? The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So I asked you, how can Mark describe himself as beginning if he's starting much later than the others do at their beginning? And that kind of helps us to understand what is unique about the Gospel of Mark. Those other things are all very important. Creation is very important. Abraham is extremely important in talking about the, the nation of Israel. And it's no surprise that Matthew would begin there. Uh, the, the miraculous birth of John the Baptist and the miraculous birth of Jesus that Luke records for us, again, extremely important in understanding how God and the Holy Spirit was behind everything that they were doing. But those weren't the things that Mark was there to talk about. What Mark wanted to talk about was the action of Jesus. And so for him, he begins when the action of Jesus begins. And that begins with the, the, uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. And really, the only thing that he says about the ministry of John the Baptist is that he baptized Jesus. And so really what Mark is doing is introducing John the Baptist only so that he can introduce Jesus and get right to the action. Yet don't mistake that, and I just lost my slides entirely. All right, you're back to me now. <laughs> uh, don't mistake that by saying that Mark doesn't have any doesn't have any feeling or that he's very cold in his presentation. In fact, just the opposite of that. Uh, Mark records more of the emotions of Jesus than the other synoptic writers, Matthew and Luke. Now, John certainly records the emotions of Jesus, emphasizing the love of Jesus. But Matthew and Luke, uh, relatively speaking, in comparison to Mark, do not show the human side of Jesus nearly as much as John does, as Mark does. Let me show you some examples of that. In Mark chapter 8 and in verse 12, Mark chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, And sighing deeply in his spirit, he says, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Jesus here is describing as just being very frustrated. He's sighing deeply. In chapter 6 and in verse 34, chapter 6, verse 34, this is the 5,000 people that had come to Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. It said, In disembarking, he saw a great multitude, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. All four of the gospel writers tell this story of feeding the 5,000, but Mark is the only one who tells us how that Jesus felt compassion on that crowd, and that's why he fed them. In chapter 6 and verse 6, when Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth, and he had to make the statement, a prophet is not without honor except in his own relatives and his own household, and said he could do no miracles there except lay his hand on a few sick people and heal them. And he wondered, wondered or marveled at their unbelief. In chapter 3, uh, I remember years ago, Brian Crawley was actually teaching a class on this, and he asked a question about Jesus and his anger. And the question was, when did Jesus um, get angry? We all think about when he turned over the tables at the, at the temple. But the Bible doesn't say he was angry. It just said that he turned over the tables of the, of the money changers. But in Mark chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, After looking around, uh, around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. In this occasion, Jesus became angry at people. We'll talk about in our class next week why he was angry. But here is the only time where we find that Jesus was described as being angry. And finally, a chapter, or one, two more, chapter 10 of Mark. Mark chapter 10 and verse 14 says, When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then finally, in chapter 21, looking at them, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, only one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. 
And of course, this is talking about the rich young ruler, the one who decided that he didn't want to be with Jesus that much that he was willing to give up his riches. And so he turned around and walked away. And yet Mark is the only one who tells us how much that Jesus felt a compassion, had a love for this man. I hope the things that, that I've talked about uh, this evening have kind of helped to give Mark some flavor, uh, to, to kind of get you interested, to, uh, to see if this is something that you're excited about studying. And, and let's again kind of open this up and see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, uh, I'm going to check my chat to see if anybody have anything down here. I don't see anybody's got a question. Um, if you got a question, raise your hand, tap on your mic, get, yeah, Matt looks like Nate's got, a, got something he wants to comment on. Oh, okay, sorry about that. You had mentioned many different uh, passages where the word immediately was used, and I assume there's going to be a thread throughout the whole study, but can you elaborate on that? A little bit more what the Greek is is the Greek straight way like you like you said all right and yes. that's what I thought I remembered and it's such a powerful uh, word that that you see because everything about the good news causes an, a response one way or the other and uh, you know the the urgency that seems to be in many of these passages of an immediate response one way or the other or whatever's going on isn't always the case um i hope that uh that we can learn more about that as we go you know it, it's yeah an immediate response is great but at the same time I'd like some, some uh, help when it's not all that immediate when it uh, grind you know and uh, you know mark being a book to the gentiles it seems like it, uh, it kind of fits and resonates resonates with all of us uh, with the grind that we're in, and uh, maybe we need to have a more uh, a more urgent tone with the things that we talk about. Yep, absolutely. I, I appreciate those thoughts. Uh, I work for uh, I work for a man who uh, told me in a philosophy that he'd been taught years ago and has always stuck with him that the best time to do something is right now. Uh, if you think about something that you want to do sometime in the future, then what you've done is wasted time thinking about it. It's always going to be in the back of your mind or you'll forget about it entirely and never get it done. The best time is right now. If it's worth doing, do it now. And that's, that's the message we're going to see in the gospel of Mark. Uh, from the very beginning of the way he started his gospel, Jesus had work to do. Um, I'll go ahead and clue you in what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, I've got it kind of themed up under the, the title, Jesus, a man of action. Uh, and Dan's right. We're going to be looking at this thread of immediately uh, all through our study. Anybody else with uh, thoughts or questions or comments? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, can. Awesome. This is Adam. Um, yes. I had always heard that Mark was kind of the most, quote unquote, the most American of Gospels because of the fact that he does get right to the action. You know, we like things to be done now, now, now. And, you know, we enjoy a movie that just gets right to the action. And so Mark, being a Gospel of kind of now, now, now and getting straight to the point, I'm, I'm assuming it's one of the reasons that Dempsey wanted to include it because when trying to do a Bible study with somebody, you can jump straight to the meat. Um, you know, it's a very short gospel. You can get right to the teaching of what's happening. There's lots of narrative that's happening. Um, so I don't know. I, I had always heard that about that. So I think you kind of backed that up with what you said. Yeah, exactly. I, I would say not necessarily American, but it's going to be people who are, action oriented the gospel of mark is going to uh, I, I think it's going to appeal to them um it, you know that's that's kind of the way i shy away from calling it the gospel to the romans even though you know, some romans had that spirit 
you know, there would have been other Romans that would have been different. It's a gospel of action. And so uh, people who are action oriented, uh, they're going to be, uh, they're going to, uh, Jesus that is presented in the gospel of Mark will appeal to them. Anybody else with thoughts or questions or comments? We've had some, some real good participation. And so far, it's working pretty well, I think. Anybody on telephone? Anybody else who has a, a comment or thought or question? And to Adam's point, um, it's the good news. So like many examples that you have all through scripture of finding a lost sheep, whatever it may be, you're telling people about that and it's reflective in your life every single day. Maybe you're not just coming out and say, saying, uh, uh, you know, God is my savior. Jesus Christ died for me to every person who walks up to you, but they can see that as a reflection uh, in your life that something's different. And, you know, if you have good news, you tell those folks around you that, you care about and that care about you that that uh, come you can come into contact every day. You tell them that because it's good news. It's important to them. As soon as I we found out that Ella was uh, going to arrive in a few months, you know we we got the word out as fast as we could. You know, and that's the the same kind of thing here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I intend to send out the. Uh, the uh, notes that I sent out this morning, uh, kind of giving you one or two questions from the readings. Um, I'd encourage you to try to do the readings. I, uh, I forgot to know who was talking about uh, doing the reading, you know, in preparation for the class tonight. That's fantastic. Um, we'll get a whole lot more out of it. I'll gain more um, if everybody else is, is preparing also as we go through these studies. Um, and I hope that the, the emails that I'm sending out will kind of give you a guideline of uh, spark some, some thoughts. I'm going to try to put in a thought question and maybe a couple of ideas in each one of these emails uh, that I hope to send out every day uh, to help us to prepare. So what we will be looking at uh, next Wednesday night will be the first four chapters uh, of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, obviously, we're not going to look at this a verse-by-verse -verse study. What I intend to do is to kind of pick one theme or one idea uh, that we will look at um, in each one of these studies, which will generally cover those uh, those chapters that we'll be looking at. Anybody else have anything to, to add before we wrap it up? Well, let me do my Tom Leach imitation and thank Matt Hudson, my studio engineer, who kept us, uh, kept everything rolling tonight. And uh, folks, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, let's close with a prayer together. Our Father, we're so very thankful for the, the blessings that you give us each and every day. We are uh, thankful particularly for the technology that we have to be able to uh, still study together, even though we are physically prevented. We're thankful for the power of your word that cannot be stifled uh, by any force on earth. We're thankful for your guiding wisdom in our lives. We're thankful especially for Jesus, his sacrifice, his example. Uh, we ask that as we study from the Gospel of Mark, that we will grow more and more to be disciples just like him. Uh, that as we live our lives, people will see Jesus in us just as we can see the Father in his life. We ask now, Father, that as we uh, end our study together, that we will be inspired to continue to study from this wonderful gospel and that we will learn much wisdom that you have revealed for us uh, in its words. We ask your blessings upon all of us as we try to serve you in your kingdom. And in Christ's name, we offer our prayer. Amen.